Pastor Mike here, and I'm online. I'm live with you today, and I'm running late. <clears throat> Had a doctor's appointment this morning. Everything's fine. Uh, my weight loss is um, its going, actually, it's going better than what I thought. And um, I appreciate all the comments that everybody has made. Um, and you've seen me dwindle down in the last few months. I asked my doctor, he walked in the room, I said, do you recognize me? He said, you're the shadow of what I used to know. And I said, yeah, that's true. So anyway, uh, just, just a routine checkup and everything's fine. And, um, naturally I'm having one of these days where my bones are just aching and there's weather. I mean, big thunderstorms came across our head earlier this morning. And uh, then trying to rush around, get everything done this morning, go to the doctor, come back, uh, choke down just a wee bit of lunch, and put some scriptures together. And I'm actually, I've, I've got a ton of articles that I want to go through today and talk. In fact, you know what? <clears throat> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk scripture here for probably a little while this morning, but there is... A couple of things here. Where's this? Oh, here it is, right here on the top. A couple of things that I'm going to go through. Then we're going to get into the scripture. You might want to pull out your Bible, King James Version. You might want to go to purebiblesearch.com if you do not have a copy of that installed on your PC, your Linux, Mac, or Windows PC. There are several Windows tablets that will run um, the Pure Bible Search software. Um, it cannot have what's called an ARM processor. ARM processor is like the mobile processors that are on phones and some tablets. But some of the Windows tablets are designed with a regular, what you would find on a desktop PC. So get that downloaded, install it, and get ready to go through scriptures. I'm going to take you down a little road that God took me down several years ago. And it was a result of asking God questions. God, I want to know this. I want to know. I want to know what this symbol means. I want to know what. Um, I want to know what Freemasons are hiding. Okay, they themselves refer to themselves not as a secret society, but as a society with secrets. And they have, in fact, the whole reason for having the Masonic Lodge may not be apparent to those just joining the Lodge, but it is it is obvious to those who are on the higher end of the, of the Masonic ladder that they are there to perpetuate and hand down from generation to generation a secret. And I wanted to know what that secret was. And I'll tell you about that in a little bit. Um, this came across and I'm just going, here we go. It occurred to me a couple of years ago, a few years ago, that we can no longer rely on the United States government <clears throat> or in for us here in Missouri, the government of the state of Missouri, we could no longer rely on our government to be the protectors of 10 commandments based morality they would no longer be the protectors of Bible Christianity or the Bible itself. We could no longer depend on the government of the United States to do what was right rather than to do what was political. We can no longer count on our government to do that. They are going to do, in many cases, what is politically expedient for them to do. And I don't care if that's Democrat or Republican or whoever it is. They're going to do, each individual uh, politician is going to do whatever it takes to perpetuate their power and enlarge their power. It is, the, it is the corrupt nature of mankind. And when you have a large percentage of politicians in America who care nothing about the Bible except during an election year, then they, they give in to the spirit that rules over them. What spirit is that? It is defined in Ephesians chapter 2 as the prince 
You have a word there, prince, principalities. That's what we're wrestling against. Uh, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. If someone is lost, be it your husband, your wife, your children, grandchildren, grandfather, if uh, the people in your neighborhood are lost, if the people who are running local government, county government, state government, city government, if those people are lost, they will be led by a spirit. They will be guided by a spirit. They will be inspired by a spirit. You can see a spirit here in this in this article, Associated Press, came out yesterday. President Barack Obama is preparing to designate the Stonewall Inn in New York as the first national monument dedicated to gay rights. That's according to two individuals familiar with the Obama administration's plans. The individuals weren't authorized to discuss the plans publicly and requested an anonymity. The tavern, and what that means is it's in secret. They want to do this thing in secret. Hang on to that thought for a minute. The tavern in which Greenwich Village was the site of a 1969 uprising, widely viewed as the start of the gay rights movement, proposals being considered would cover a small park on the street where the bar is located and the surrounding area. The Interior Department says Interior Secretary Sally Jewell, the head of the National Park Service, will <clears throat> travel to New York for a public meeting on the proposals Monday. The Washington Post first reported the meeting. The White House declined to comment. So get ready. National Park in the United States of America that is going to, that is going to exalt and honor immorality at its basis sort they're going to honor abominable acts they're going to honor abominable people who perform those abominable acts ungodly is the way jude described what enoch said the ungodly acts committed by ungodly people in an ungodly way our government is going to now honor these people. I do not even want to use my imagination to picture what sort of monument would be put up. I don't even want to know. But rest assured, it is going to be an abomination. <clears throat> Our Bible tells us to watch out for, in fact, it gives a woe to them. Woe to them who call good evil and evil good. And that's what it's turned into. Because if you speak out against a man who now has the free reign to go into the ladies' restroom where your wife and your daughter is, if you say anything against that, you're a bad person. And we have we have loosed in this nation a what I've called a Baphomet spirit. And if you don't know what Baphomet is, look it up. B-A-P-H-O-M-E-T. Baphomet is sort of the um, the zeitgeist, the spirit of of the day that is loose in this nation. It is the what, what uh, John referred to as the spirit of Antichrist. Because remember, in Revelation 17, we find out that the Antichrist is a fusion of opposites. He is the one who is not and yet is. He is dead and alive at the same time. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus actually didn't say it that way. He said, I am he who was dead and am now alive. He is, Jesus is not dead and alive at the same time. He was dead and now he is alive. But the Antichrist, the beast, given to us in Revelation 17, we are told <clears throat> that he 
is not, and yet is. He is the opposite. He is like Schrodinger's cat in quantum physics. And this is a, a mental physics experiment that a guy named Schrodinger came up with. I don't remember all the details, but the idea is the cat is both alive and dead at the same time. He exists in a quantum state. Quantum computers can actually have a, a qubit, which is a quantum bit, where a, an electronic switch is both on and off at the exact same time. And we cannot, we cannot even fathom that. It would be like if, my, if I had one arm in my body that was both right and left arm at the same time. I cannot even picture what that would be. All right? But Baphomet is a fusion of opposites. He is a male and a female. He's an androgynous god. And that's what spirit is pervading in this country. It is what spirit that is, uh, remember, we are wrestling against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness where? In high places. You don't get any higher in America than the White House, than the Congress, than the Supreme Court. We are dealing with spiritual wickedness in those high places. And that spirit of Baphomet is a union of opposites. And that spirit is, is the one making all the decisions. That spirit is the one that's winning all the court cases. That spirit is the one that is being driven into people's minds. And let me tell you, yes, there is a core of America that I think is still somewhat moral. But what's been creeping in, and a lot of you have written me and told me this, uh, one lady a couple years ago, I remember she said that um, one morning she was she walked her child down to the bus stop and there's all these other moms waiting with their children to put them safely on the on the uh, federal school bus. And um, all of a sudden the conversation came up about, I guess, gay weddings or something like that. And this woman just spoke up in a pleasant way, but just spoke up and said, that's not right. They shouldn't do that. And she got looks from these other women, these other moms piercing her. And then the venom started coming out. One hateful woman just blasted her over her hatred. And you call yourself a Christian. And yet you, what, what kind of Christian value is hatred, huh? And this woman was, she was married to a guy, had a child, and yet she, all of a sudden now, is this champion for LGBT rights. And we are seeing this everywhere. You put up, you, you put a, fo- a post on Facebook. I almost said a post on Facebook. You put a post on Facebook that says, I am against sodomite weddings and give scripture. Romans chapter 1 comes to mind. You find others. You say, I'm against this for biblical reasons. And just see the number of people on your friends list who will absolutely come out and just, with their words, they want to kill you. They, they hate your guts, and they don't mind you knowing about it. Because Facebook is that, is that empowerment thing where people in this world who ordinarily nobody would give a flip what they said about things going on in the world. Now everybody has this empowerment called Facebook and they can say whatever they want to and not have to look somebody in the eye to do it. So it's an enabler is what it is. And these people come out with their venom toward you because you still believe in old-fashioned American morality, Bible morality. And they don't. My suspicion is, number one, of course they're lost. Even though they brag about going to church, they are lost. They have that spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. And more than likely, somebody that they know and love is a sodomite or transgendered or in a gay wedding or whatever it is. Or, or, these people themselves have closet sodomite relationships even while they are married prevalent with women and men as well but they're having closet sodomite relationships 
they don't want anybody to find out about. And that's why they come against you. That's one of the reasons why they come against you. But the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience is working. And Bible and, and here's what I was saying. We can no longer depend on the government to protect our religion and our way of life and our morality and our standards and our Bible. We can no longer count the state of Tennessee wanted to vote to put the Bible in as the official book of the state of Tennessee. Goes down in a flaming ball of defeat. Why? Not enough people want that anymore. Forty years ago under Ronald Reagan, you would have never had a problem with that. Or 30 years ago. Yeah, 30 years ago. You would have not had an issue with that. That would have gone through just about anywhere. 40 years ago, 50 years ago, that was that was a no-brainer. Yes, absolutely do that thing. But today, there isn't there are not enough people that believe that way anymore. Who is going to defend the Bible? Who is going to defend morality? Who is it that is going to defend the freedom that we have in this nation that is brought on by personal responsibility and personal morality who is going to defend that the only people who can defend it are the people who believe in it and who try to live it every day those are the only ones left now that's going to defend it nobody else is going to do it for us we've already had in our recent history our lazy days when we just counted on the government to do what was right as far as morality goes in this country. We can no longer depend on that. So we're going to have to get up off our couch and do something about, about defending what it is that is precious to us, and that is every word of God being pure. But that spirit is pervading everywhere. There's another article here, and... Um, I'm, I was going to try to post these on the Facebook.com slash. You see it right there, Pastor Mike Online Facebook page. But I changed my password um, the other day. I started getting text messages just out of the blue, one from my Gmail account, one from my Facebook account, wanting verification for a login. And I'm going, I didn't log in. I didn't do it. So I went around changing passwords, and I changed my password on Facebook. I think I wrote it down somewhere. Okay? You're going to have to try to figure that one out. But anyway, listen to this. Uh, do you remember the Watchmen video we did called Chemical Sorcery? Despite the risk, Americans flock to Amazon for ayahuasca ritual and, here we go, spiritual awakening. A centuries-old ritual from the Amazon region. Now, that does not, Amazon does not mean Amazon.com. I just, you know, thought I would throw that in there, okay? It is not Jeff Bezos, and you cannot get there through Amazon.com. But anyway, from the Amazon region, like Brazil, uh, is finding its way to a growing number of Americans who are giving ayahuasca, a powerful psychotropic plant, a try in their quest for spiritual enlightenment, usually in the form of of faraway retreats. A select group doesn't need to travel far since a few years ago the Supreme Court authorized ayahuasca's use in six U.S. states, though the court limited its use for religious purposes only. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I get it. While shamans, indigenous priests who perform the ritual, do, do, you, know, do you know anything about these priests, these shamans? Okay, um, shamans are these are these like priests who are sort of the mediator between you and the gods, the spirits that are out there. That's what a shaman is, and for the most part, these shamans they grow up from children, um, and the elder shamans will declare over certain children, "You have the force, Luke." Okay, and these kids now become uh, being trained to be these mediators between humans and all these different spirits out there in the jungle and the forest and everything like that. 
And then once these children are tagged as a shaman in training, that they have the force, they are referred to as the untouchables. And probably most of y'all have heard that before. You just didn't put two or two together. Do you not remember the phrase, please don't squeeze the shaman? I thought that was pretty funny. Anyway, while shamans, please don't squeeze, indigenous priests who perform the ritual have been around forever in the Amazonian rainforest where the days-long trip is meant to do its magic in conjunction with nature. In recent years, the practice, be practice has become increasingly popular among Americans to the point that many are venturing to remote jungles of Latin America for the experience. But those who do so could be putting their lives at risk. Even some celebrities, this does not surprise me, even some celebrities have been known to have traveled south for an ayahuasca experience, including Sting, or is that Stink? Is his name Stink or Sting? Sting, okay. Could be Stink, right? Chelsea Handler, Michelle Rodriguez, and Jim Carrey. The cost for an average 6- to 12-day retreat in Peru is between $1,000 and $3,500, which typically includes housing, moderate meals, a dose of ayahuasca, and a bucket to barf in. That's no joke because most people that try ayahuasca for the first time, they have this amazing trip. And then kind of when they're coming down from it, they're going all over the place. So the price does include... A bucket to barf in. The ritual has been around for centuries. Shamans, who you cannot squeeze, were already cooking up the brew, also known as La Medicina. La Medicina. Which is Spanish for the Medicina. When Spanish conquistadors landed on South America land in the 16th century. And I talked about this in Chemical Sorcery. Um, the New Age movement, those who meditate, those who mind meld with the universe... Uh, will recognize that there are two ways that you can get in contact with the gods, the spirits, um, little fairies dancing around, uh, the gnomes, the elementals, the dragons, or whatever it is. You can get in contact with them either by deep mind meditation, which sometimes takes quite a while to master, uh, fortunately, there is enough people in churches all across America who would be glad to teach you contemplative prayer practices to get you into it. Number two, uh, using some sort of hallucinogenic drug like LSD. Uh, remember um, uh, Watson and Crick. Uh, Crick is the one who admitted years later that he was taking small doses of LSD so that he could clear his mind and go through a door um, because he was a cohort with Aldous Huxley who talked about this door. There's all these thoughts that humans could have, but there's a door shut that we can't get open. So you take a little bit of LSD, and that opens the door. Jim Morrison named his rock group The Doors after that principle. We're going to open the doors. Think about Revelation 9, the key to the bottomless pit, the bottomless pit being open. Now, we're, now we have access to all this stuff coming up in the smoke. Okay, get it? So anyway, Crick does this. You have uh, the tech giants in Silicon Valley and other places where the, the researchers themselves are on a daily dose of LSD or other door-opening drugs so that they can visualize the latest and the greatest technology and the advancements so the company can make billions and billions of dollars. These people, I'm telling you, they operate on a different different layer, different level. They operate in a, in a field that is far beyond what you and I can comprehend. And I'm not saying it's better by any means. But they have access to spirits directly that most of us we just don't have now here's here's the odd thing let me tell you what let me tell you what the devil has done in this nation let me tell you what he's done he has successfully 
in many areas of this country, he has successfully marketed his way of eternal damnation, but not market it as eternal damnation. Don't try to sell it like that. Don't try to sell it like, if you take a puff on this one time, you are going to hell in a handbasket. He never says that. Unless, of course, you are a singer with ACDC or somebody like that. Okay, But anyway, um, or you're a headbanger, rock and roll person, whatever. But other than that, he markets that as an awakening. Let's get into New Age meditation practices. Let's empty our minds. Let's clear our minds of all thoughts. Let's, let's vacuum suck it out so that nothing is there. Let us go into an altered state of consciousness similar to hypnotism where the firewall, you know what a firewall is, between your legs and your motor in your car. There is a steel wall called a firewall. It is meant to prevent fire from coming in. Uh, When I worked in construction, hanging drywall, if the house being built was a had an attached garage, then the walls and the ceiling separating that garage from the house that it was attached to had to be drywalled in a different way. It had to have a uh, thicker drywall with uh, fiberglass in it. It was a flame retardant. It had to be taped a certain way. The, the seams had to be covered and so on so as to try to not allow fire to get into the house. Well, you have in your brain a wall, a firewall. It's called sobriety. While you are sober, you have access to the, the frontal lobe of your mind, which makes these moral decisions. In other words, um, let's say that you're looking at this nice lady or this nice, good-looking hunk of a guy, and you're looking at him, and your mind starts getting this little creativity thing going, and you start imagining things. But this area of your head here, your forehead, is telling you, stop that. Stop that. You can't do that. You're going to lose everything. That's bad. And so you go, okay, can't do that. All right? You have the ability to say no, to say yes. You have the ability to make rational, logical decisions. When you alter your consciousness, either through meditation or through ayahuasca or LSD or, here we go, going to trip somebody's trigger, marijuana, when you alter your consciousness... That there's a portal opens up in that wall, a door. And when that door is open, there are spirits who are just dying to get in there. There are things in your mind that are dying to be released that should not ever be released. That's what's going on. And they call it an awakening. But the truth of it is, It's almost like they're in a dream state. And these people have some of the wackiest, weirdest. If you go back and look at the rock and roll lyrics that came out in the early to mid-70s, you're going to see a lot of LSD use. You're going to see a lot of lyrics that sound good in the song. They rhyme. But unless you are high, you don't get it. Even the guys that wrote it, when they come down, they would go, did I write that? Yeah, man, don't you remember? No, I don't remember a thing. Did I? Are you sure I wrote that? Well, sure, man, yeah. You were humming it, dude. I don't remember. And they go record it. It's a million bestseller. But what has happened here, the devil has sold to the American public, richest, wealthiest nation on the planet, has sold this idea that Christianity, and, and I will say, what I refer to as the Christian industrial complex, big Christian in this nation, big money Christianity in this nation, has almost it's destroyed the reputation of true biblical Christianity. No one in America takes the Christian serious anymore. Why? Because most churches are so full of money grubbers and adulterers and pedophiles and sodomites. The nation, the world says... The world says, America says to 
people who go to church. Oh, really? You're against transgendered bathrooms? You're throwing a fit over that? And your pastor's a homosexual? And he's sodomizing children? Really? That's your morality? See? Kind of shooting ourselves in the foot here. But our, our nation is not going to defend Christianity. Our nation, at, at, in turn now, is going to turn to these altered states that promise enlightenment. Let me tell you something that I know about Bible Christianity, and you'll hear me say that a lot. That is in opposition to the Christian industrial complex. Bible Christianity, if you want thrills, I mean, if you want thrills, Open your Bible. Open a King James Bible and read it. And at some point, God is going to give you an understanding of what you're reading. It's going to click with something that's been floating around in your head for years. And when it does, you'll get goosebumps. You'll start feeling, you'll get this feeling of elation tears may come down your eyes or laughter may come out of your voice you will be different from that day forward and even though you come down from the emotional response to it the word that god gave you from his written bible will stay with you forever and forever and ever. It will never go away. You want to thrill? Let God show you something from his word. Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. And when God reveals his secrets to you, you're just going, mind blown. That's like the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. Those of you who have been doing this, uh, I'd love to hear your testimony. Okay, send send us an email, pastormikeonline at gmail.com. I'd I'd love to hear from you. How God just just gave you something that this world could never give you. But see, these people want access to some sort of secret awareness. They want access to some sort of secret idea or secret doctrine or uh, whatever it is. And these devils that are on the other side of this ayahuasca trip at first are more than glad to give them a a form of ecstatic experience. They're all too eager to give them this high that they're looking for. Those of you who have done drugs in your life, You probably remember the first time you took a a real heavy drug, illegal substance, and the euphoria and the high that you felt. And you wanted more, and you wanted more, and you wanted more. And each time you did more, the experience decreased while your need and the demand for more of the drug increased. So that it comes to a point to where you're now just taking the drug to be normal, not high. Because the effects of the drug has brought you so far down, high now is where you started out from. You drink or take drugs just to be normal. The drugs now, my brother-in-law told me this, Mike, the drugs do you after a while. And I believe that. You contrast that with, and, and you remember, go on the internet and Google all of these pictures of meth users. You'll see, you'll see their, their mugshot the first time they got arrested for meth. And then over the years, every time they get arrested, a new mugshot is taken. And you can just see the decline in their looks. Some of the most beautiful girls, 19, 20 year old young ladies who have given themselves over to these things. They look like 80-year-old hags within five years. That's what these drugs, that's what this stuff, meth and all that stuff does to them. But people are trying to gain access to new 
things, new ventures. They want new knowledge. That's what uh, that's what Crick wanted when he was looking into how DNA. He wanted he wanted to beat everybody else on what DNA looked like and how it was put together and so on. He wanted that, and so he altered his consciousness in order to get it. Other people have various motivations for doing this, but they want to know things that currently we don't know right now. So I'm going to take us on a little journey through the scriptures. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. I love this verse. Um, There was a time in my life when I wasn't even aware that a verse like this existed in the scriptures. But Amos chapter 3, verse 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Now, I want you to take that. I don't have it in my notes. I want you to take that and um, let me put a bookmark here. I got my old Bible out. Revelation chapter 10. I want you to take that idea and turn to Revelation chapter 10. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And what that means is, and this is, this is for those of y'all who already believe the Bible, Because there are some out there who have been inoculated against too many Bible verses. What I mean by that is they've been told or they actually came up with the idea and they think it was an original idea. This idea about God that says um, not everything that God does is in the Bible. Really? Where'd you get that from? Well, I didn't get it from the Bible, I can tell you that. They try to convince you of that. A guy tried to convince me of that, Mike. Mike. Look, not everything that God is doing right now is in the Bible. There are things that God's doing right now that are not in the Scriptures. And I'm just going, uh, no, that's not, that's not what Paul said. Paul said all Scripture is given by inspiration for God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works, which basically means if it's to be done and if it's a good work and God wants us to have it, then it's in the scriptures. Jesus himself, Jesus himself was not going to operate outside of the bounds of the written word of God. For Jesus himself said, Hebrews chapter 10, you see it, uh, what psalm is it in? Uh, I come low in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. When Jesus came the first time and when he comes the second time, it will be by the book. It was by the book and it will be by the book. He does not stray outside of the bounds of the written record of the word of God. In Amos, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Now, take what I just said, because there are these latter-day prophets. And I think I would spell that with an F rather than a P-H, P-R-O-F-I-T. These latter-day for-profit prophets who prophesy out of their own neck that was a little. When my girls were little, they used to want me to tell stories before they went to bed. And so I would, every now and then, I'd bring in a little storybook. And Alicia would say, Dad, no, I don't want you to read a story. Tell us a story out of your neck. Right here. Which means one that I made up. So anyway, they prophesy out of their neck. They make up things. They and they they have a little dance that they do. Woo, ooh, mm, mm. Praise, ooh, praise God. Mm. Ooh, that's powerful. Whew. You know what they're really doing? They're trying to dream up something to say. All right, that's what they're really doing. They're trying to. They're trying. They're using the imaginative center in their brain to draw out a picture of what they need to tell you. And they write up this little thing while they're going, ooh, yeah, ooh, hallelujah, ooh, that's good, God, mm, 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 mm. 
Boy, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Oh, you want me to tell them? Oh, I'll tell them. Amen. Praise Jesus. Then I'll give you this bunch of nonsense. You see, they want you to think that they are the prophets that's being referred to in Amos chapter 3. That's what they want you to think. They want you to think that 90% of what God is doing now is not in the Bible. God's doing all these new things out there. And he's doing things a different way. And it's a different church. And it's a different way of, it's a different spirit to what it is. That's what Paul warned us about. Another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. But here, it, you just contrast that. Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And ooh, ooh, I'm getting a word. Ooh, hallelujah, amen. Let me tell you what the word from God is. In uh, Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Let me, let me check here. And surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. The mystery of God should be finished, as he hath, um, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Same thing. Same thing. Here's the difference. The word mystery is not used anywhere in the Old Testament. It is a Greek word, musterion, which means, you know what it means? You know what the Greek word musterion really means? Mystery. See how simple that is? Uh, so in the Old Testament, they would use the word secret. But, and, you've, and I've done this. I've got a, a DVD series called Babylon's Mystery, Revealed or something like that. And what I did was I just went in every place in the Bible, which would be only the New Testament, and I went looking at the mystery. And every place, see, I, I learned this years ago, every place the word mystery is found in the Bible, in the New Testament, it's revealing a mystery. It's revealing something that had been kept hidden. Behold, Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, behold, I show you a mystery. Jesus said, the first time it's ever used, Jesus was teaching the parable of the seed and the sower. And he said, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. Then he said later on, same parable, Mark recorded it. Um, unto you it is given to know the mysteries, plural, of the kingdom of God. They, those are one and the same. They're giving you like two bird's eye views of the same thing, the same concept, same idea. But when the Bible uses the word mystery you can rest assured that it's going to explain what that mystery is all about. In Revelation chapter 17, we referenced that a while ago, the beast that was and is not and yet is, the angel tells John, I will show you the mystery of the beast or the woman and the beast that carrieth her. I will give you, I will tell you what this means. And people are, are searching everywhere. People are joining the lodge. People are getting on uh, ayahuasca trips. People are wanting to smoke marijuana. People are wanting to take LSD. They're wanting to get this high. They're wanting this altered state of consciousness. And I'll tell you something. Though, and believe it or not, believe it or not, there are people who call themselves Bible-believing Christians that defend marijuana use. Defend it. And I can tell you that people who smoke marijuana, they do not think the way Bible believers think. It has, and they don't recognize it, but it has altered their perception. It has altered their thinking. And they will stop at nothing to defend smoking a doobie. They will stop at nothing. They will get angry at you. I knew a guy. I worked with him. He hung drywall. His uncle was a pastor that I knew. He claimed to be a born-again Christian. And I found out from somebody else that knew him that he likes to have a little marijuana every night when he, before he, when he just helps him relax, I guess. Smoke a little marijuana. And I, I, next time I got around, of course, I was young back then and arrogant. And I would, I, next time I got around him, he was hanging drywall in the house. And I mean, I unloaded on the pot smokers. 
deliberately in front of him. And he come unglued at me. Some of you out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like now that they are smoking the reefer, they've got reefer madness. Dun, dun, that needs music. Reefer madness. Ah! And they defend it even at the cost of your friendship and fellowship. Okay, I'm just telling you, that's how, but people are chasing this stuff down because they want this altered perception. They want this new knowledge, this new consciousness to get in them. That's what's driving the, and the legislatures all over America are now wanting to model Colorado and Washington to legalize the recreational use of marijuana. The state of Missouri still has in its legislature a super majority. They are they are over. They will send. They will pass by this insane margin some conservative bill. They'll send it to Jay Nixon, the liberal Democrat Obamaite, and he will veto it, which gets sent back to the legislature, and they just override the veto. So Missouri right now as a state is not entertaining a marijuana bill that I'm aware of, a recreational use marijuana bill. But that could all change this year in in this election. They're looking for a secret. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants and prophets. Now I remember reading this years ago when God was going to show me things from the Bible. And it clicked in me. I, I, I said to myself, Everything is in the Bible. That is what this ministry is all about, that everything is in the Bible, and if it's not in the Bible, it does not exist. And a lot of you have have come around to that, and I just give all the praise and the glory to Jesus Christ because only God can tell you that. If I say it, a lot of people just brush it off. If God says it to you, you know it, and you know it forever. Everything is in the Bible. The Bible is everything. And if God is going to do something, especially prophetic related, it's everything we need to know about it is in the Bible. And I used to, I used to, I had a, an electronic copy of the book of Enoch. And I got like turned on to it. I'm reading Enoch and I'm going, Oh, wow, man, this got like all the stuff about the giants that, you know, like the Bible doesn't have. And and I, I maybe Enoch, you know, should, should I don't think it should be in the Bible, but I think we should read it, man, and get all this new. See, I used to be that way. I used to be that way. We used to condone the reading of the book of Enoch, which I thought that Jude said that Enoch wrote what Jude quoted him as, and Jude did not say that. Jude said that Enoch said it, but he didn't write it. Enoch did not write a book, all right? That's called a pseudepigrapha, which is like Latin for a fake pig or something like that. Anyway, pseudepigrapha. It's like they put Enoch's name on it, but it wasn't Enoch. A ghostwriter. By the way, that's what Joyce Myers, Creflo Dollar, Joel Osteen, all these big name Christian industrial complex book writers, they have ghost writers. Okay? They do. They have people that are hired to write out books for them. They put their name on it. It's their copyright. They make the million dollars. The ghost writer, he just gets a salary out of it. I'm just I'm just telling you how it works. All right? But anyway, the the goal of making all this money is so that you don't have to work near as hard to make that much money. That's the goal of it. Oh, the book of Enoch. That's where I was going. And I, I hear, and I've come around now to, number one, realizing I do not believe Enoch wrote a book, and there is no scripture indication that Enoch ever did. So when people ask me, Pastor, have you ever read the book of Enoch? I say to them, I have. Don't trust it. Don't trust the book of Enoch 
Because the claim by, especially a lot of the prophecy, quote-unquote, ministries out there that are pushing the book of Enoch, they're even claiming now that there are messianic prophecies in the book of Enoch. Now, here's my big problem with that. I just quoted for you Hebrews 10. Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written to do thy will, O God. Everything that Christ did at his first coming, everything that Christ does at his second coming is done by the book. He's not going to do anything that's written in some other book. So when the book of Enoch has, quote-unquote, messianic prophecies in it, my first inclination is to say, I don't think it's the right messiah. It's not the right Christ. It's a different messiah that it's prophesying of. I don't trust it, and I don't think you should either. And I don't think you should, I'm just... Just throwing it out there. If you want to, if you want to give money to these experts, so they can spend time studying the Book of Enoch and get up and lie to you, you be my guest. But I'm encouraging you get your King James Bible out and start reading it because I'm telling you, there's more stuff in that Bible than you were ever aware of. And once you realize that God has already written down his secrets in a book called the Word of God, you won't be looking anywhere else. You will not, you won't, you'll say, you know what? I don't need ayahuasca. I don't need LSD. I don't need marijuana. I don't need to get stammering drunk in order to have this new awareness. I don't need it. I have a Bible. I'll read it, and when God gets ready to show me something that's going to blow my mind, he'll show me something that'll blow my mind. So God has revealed his secrets to his servants, the prophets, and those prophets wrote it down. It's in the book, people. you got to find it. Um... Let's go to Deuteronomy 13. We're looking at the... Here's what I'm doing. I, I, uh, years ago, I wanted to know what the secret of Freemasonry was. And so that, that kind of put me into reading Masonic literature. How silly I was back then. For assuming and thinking that I would eventually get my hands on a secret Masonic book wherein the true secret of Freemasonry was actually written word for word in. How silly I was. And I was reading stuff like crazy. I was reading Morals and Dogma. I was reading Secret Teachings of All Ages. I was finding old Masonic books in the Google Books library that were free downloads because they were 100 years old or older. And I'd just read them. I'm going, oh, maybe it's in this one. The 7,000-plus uh, volume library that they have at the House of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C. I thought for sure they'd never let me even peek behind the door into this room. I found out you can go in there, fill out a, a little information sheet about yourself, have that in their file, on, in their database, and you can pretty much look at any book they've got in there. Some of them are hundreds of years old. Naturally, they're not going to take let you take home a 200-year-old book, but they will let you read it. And I read Morals and Dogma, and it dawned on me. Albert Pike said, I don't know how many times in Morals and Dogma, he referenced the secret and he said, of which we cannot write at this time. We cannot say anything in this volume. We cannot tell you what this secret is. We have to let this remain unwritten. He never wrote it in there. Now, he talked about mythology. He talked about moral lessons. He talked about uh, ancient uh, religious practices and beliefs, sort of, sort of in the similar manner that Manley Hall did in Secret Teachings but never word for word said, here is the secret of masonry. We hope no one reads this book other than masons. 
and I realized they didn't write it down. Boy, did I get angry. I got upset. I got impatient because I wanted to know this, and I can't explain to you why I wanted to know. I There was no life threatening situation going on in my life where I, I've got to know this secret or they're going to kill me. I, there was nothing like that. I just, there was just something in me that I want to know what that is. Dan Brown, we, we hear he's written the Da Vinci Code and that kind of got me going. And then we hear he's going to write a book about Freemasonry. The next novel, Robert Langdon, the symbologist, is going to uncover the secrets. So I'm going... What's he going to write about? So I'm reading books about what Dan Brown might write about. Had a dream. I'm not making this up. I had a dream one night that I was in Washington, D.C., and I went into, like, Lincoln's Memorial because I was, like, I was like on a trek. I was given one clue, and I went into the Lincoln Memorial to go find the next clue. And when I get inside the Lincoln Memorial, Dan Brown is in there, and he's writing in a notebook, and he closes the book, gives me a stare, and leaves. And I'm going, oh, he beat me to it. I'm not kidding you. And I woke up going, okay, that was pretty weird. I cannot tell you what was driving me. Maybe it was the Holy Spirit. God just put this on my heart. The secret, the secret, the secret. Got to know the secret. And I remember a, a friend of mine in the ministry, Brother Jeremy Howell, he was preaching for us that weekend, and I said, Jeremy, I said, you know what I've came to the conclusion of? He said, what's that? I said, I think the secret of Freemasonry is actually written down in a book, in one book. I said, I think that it's in the King James Bible. And he said, Mike, I think you're right. Let me know when you find it. How do you know I will? Just let me know. It's okay. So I'm reading the Bible some more, reading the Bible some more. God, I want to know what this secret is. I want to know what it is. And this went on for quite some time. I just, I wanted, and meanwhile, I'm still reading everything else. And the 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 value of that is is that I'm I'm gathering I'm I'm sort of like a uh, reconnaissance officer I'm gathering intelligence I'm gathering facts from uh, morals and dogma from secret teachings of all ages from a book called the Masonic Ladder written in the 1800s I'm I'm just gathering intelligence from the History Channel and whatever you know and finally it's the Holy Ghost will lead you in your study. And I characterize it this way. It's like the Holy Ghost said, you, you want to know what the secret is? Duh. You know I want to know. You really want to know? Yeah. You going to study it in the Bible? Yeah. Here's the word. Secret. And I went, oh, it's that simple? Study it out. Deuteronomy 13. Verse 1, here's what you ought to be prepared for. There are going to be people who are going to try to entice you with a secret doctrine. I told you to go to Deuteronomy 13, right? Hang on to that. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Genesis chapter 2, chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of, of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, let me tell you who Eve represents here. Eve represents the Christian industrial complex. What Eve did is what is being done now in churches, seminaries, Bible colleges, Bible institutes, publishing houses, denominations, ministries all over the world. And that is 
adding to the word of God or the words of God. Because God's word was, in Genesis 2.16, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. 39 words there in your King James Bible. 39 words. You know what that means? That was the proto-law. 39 books in the Old Testament, which is the law. And there are 39 words here, and God was giving sort of a microcosm of the law. He gave him one commandment, therefore there was one sin. We blew that one. So God then multiplied the commandments and multiplied the sins. Why did God do that? He tells us in Romans. So that every man would understand that God has concluded everybody under sin. Everybody is a sinner. Everybody. There's enough laws for everybody to break in the Bible. And everybody breaks them. So God never said in his word, never said, Adam, don't even touch it. The Christian industrial complex does. They cannot, they cannot stick to just the word of God. It either has to be through scholarly intellect or it's done through Pentecostal words of knowledge, words of wisdom, or it's done through the Christian dope smokers, or it's done through contemplative prayer, or where, whatever form it takes. Eve is the Christian industrial complex that always adds to the Word of God. In other words, what God, God said we couldn't eat of it. And what God really meant was he doesn't even want us to touch it. Remember the Pharisees? They didn't have the, they didn't follow the law. They followed the Talmud. They followed the Tanakh. They followed the commentaries, the rabbis' commentaries on the previous rabbis' commentaries on the law. That's what they followed. They did what Eve did. They they complicated the the word of God so much that they were leading people astray. So that's what God said. Now Eve's going, oh, we can't even touch it. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. Now see what he's done here is contradicted God's word. And he's taken away now the consequences of sin. And he's telling Eve what the, the spirit of the day is telling Ray Kurzweil and all of the scientists. He's telling them, you shall not surely die. It's not written in stone anywhere that you have to die. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. it is. Okay? For it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Then they could receive the second death, or they could receive the second life, eternal life. But the idea is the devil contradicted, and he's still speaking now to people all over the world who are working in genetics, who are working in technology, who are working in 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 brain to technology interfaces so that humans can remain alive. Ye shall not surely die. Then he said, watch this, look at verse 5, for God doth know. Now the devil is imparting to Eve a secret doctrine. A doctrine that Number one, God never spoke to Adam. A doctrine that is not in the word of God to mankind. In other words, it's a doctrine that did not come from the Bible. You know what the devil's saying? Eve, not everything that God does and knows and wants for us is in the Bible. He's the one that came up with that. For God doth know, is what he said, that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, little g, and plural, knowing good and evil. And in that sense, the good and evil are opposites that are joined together in the same fruit. It's Picture it like this. I hand you a fruit. You say, where'd you get it? Don't worry about it. Tell me how it tastes. And so you eat it, and you're perplexed. 
yet you don't know how to describe it. And then I say the words, doesn't that taste both bad and good at the same time? And you're going, yeah, that's it. Mm, I hate this. I love it. Right? Good and evil were fused inside this one fruit. That's Baphomet. That is the transgendered spirit. That is the androgynous god, Dionysus, or Dionysus. The god of wine and revelings and parties and being drunk is an androgynous god. He is a male female who has really has to go to the bathroom really bad. But he can't decide which one he wants to be. And isn't it interesting that stores and other places are accommodating the transgendered movement by having a male bathroom, a female bathroom, and then we have the Baphomet bedroom, ba- bedroom, bathroom, the Baphomet bathroom. You try to say it, Baphomet bathroom. You did, didn't you? Ha, uh-huh, I got you, I got you, I got you. <laughs> anyway, the Baphomet bathroom, which is... It's got both symbols for male and female on it. Okay? So now, no one has to be left out. They can go in the transit. You watch it. You watch it. Let's say, let's say five years. Five years. Let's say in five years, they start mandating that every building where people are allowed to come in public building must by law accommodate transgendered baphomets including places of worship except the muslims because the muslims they don't like that that's against their religion so we have to do what the muslims say but forget the christians right But you get it now. Here's a secret doctrine. The devil is the one who came up with the mystery religions. With the help of Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She is the spirit that guides over that. So in Deuteronomy 13, watch this. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, the sign of the wonder come to pass, wherever he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt, notice he says gods, plural. Think of, think of the Roman Catholic priest who tells people, See all these statues here? That's St. Paul over there. That's St. Peter. That's uh, St. Mary. So we have Peter, Paul, and Mary. Okay. Of the magic dragon. We have Peter, Paul, and Mary. We have St. Uh, Ignatius over here, St. Ignoramus over here, and we have this saint over here. These are the ones you pray to, the gods, because that's what they are. They can call them the saints, but the truth of it is, the Catholic Church worships multiple gods because every one of these quote unquote saints is a pathway to God. You can use St. Jude. You can use St. Joseph. You can use uh, St. Louis. You can use St. Genevieve. Those are towns in this area, by the way. St. Genevieve, St. Louis. uh, What is it? St. Francis down south. You can use all of these little deities and pray to them, and they are access roads to God. And this is what this is what's written in here. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now watch this. Because and I remember the first time I read in the scriptures, Jeremiah said it, Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hands. And I went, What? Did what? Babylon? You mean God controls Babylon? Oh, yeah. And he uses her. And God is using the mystery religions right now. He's using the prophets and the dreamers of dreams. He is using them right now for his purpose and his will. Because God is going to prove everybody 
to see what they really believe. Your faith is going to be on trial. Because there's a lot of people who say, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I don't go to church. Well, I'm a Christian. See, there's a lot of people that say that. There's a lot of people in churches who want you to think that they're just as Christian as Peter, Paul, and Mary. Well, that's fine if they want to think that. But look at this. The Lord your God proveth you. Who sent that prophet or the dreamer of dreams, saying, let's go after other gods? Who sent him? God did to prove you. And you see, some of you, and I love it. I love it. I've had some, uh, I had a couple of people call today. A pastor down in Arkansas had a, just a, I apologize, I couldn't stay on the phone with him longer, but I had to go to the doctor. But he just said, Pastor, thank you. Thank you for what you did. I've had people call and just say, we just wanted to thank you. You helped us. We were in the Hebrew roots and wham, God pulled us out. We saw your videos. God took us out. Some guy said, the day I got saved, I started watching your videos. And he said, thank you. Some of you are realizing that God was putting your faith on trial to see if you really believed the stone which the builders disallowed to see if you really believed that one book. And if anything, anything in this world contradicted that book, it was a lie, and that book is right 100% of the time. And I just say to you, thank God that he allowed me to be part of that in your life because he didn't have to. I'll tell you that right now. But see, there's a lot of people still coming out, still coming out, still coming out. Because God put their faith on trial. And they heard about this from a sister of theirs or their cousin or their mom is into this. and they, Or there's somebody they go to church with. Oh, have you read the, have you read, um, oh, what, was, what was that book? I can't remember anything. Anyway, have you read such and such book? Have you heard such and such doctor on on YouTube? Have have you heard about the the Hebrew Roots movement? How we should go back and do Passover? And some guy wrote me a, an email. Um, he said, Pastor, the Passover meal is much worse than you describe. And he's talking about the Passover Seder that that Jews have, and he said the ones that the Hebrew roots are being conned into. Um, the, uh, apparently the Ashkenazis Jews practice the Passover meal as a hate act against Christians. That I can believe. That I can believe. And you were led out of that. God put your faith on trial. But those who are in it now, you pray for them because you were like them. And God is still pulling people out. He's pulling people out of the seventh day. He's pulling people out of Roman Catholicism. He's pulling people out of the sacred name, Hebrew roots. He's pulling people out of of liberal Christianity. He's pulling people out of denominations that deny the word of God. He's pulling people out of... Uh, there's a, and, and I want you to know you if you're listening, I, I know about it. My wife shared it with me. I read over what you asked me to read over. There is a, a family that is coming out of a position that they have. And that's all I'm going to say. But when they read the doctrinal statement, that was handed to them, and which they were to sign and say, yes, we approve of this. It said, we believe the words of God are the inspired, inerrant word of God in only the original manuscript. And they said, we can't sign that. We don't believe that. So God is still pulling people out, and you just have patience with people. But there are people whose faith has already been on trial by God, and they are found wanting. They believe the prophet or the dreamer of dreams, and they're going after the false gods. Um, look at verse 4. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. 
And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil from the midst of thee. Now, I will say that in the Old Testament law, that is exactly what they were to do. They were to take these, whoever's going to rise up in dissension against the plan of God, they were to take them out and stone them. Now, today you get thrown in prison for 10 to 20 years if you do that. But here's what you can do. You can make their teachings as if they were dead to you. You can say to yourself and to God, God, with your help, I'll never listen to this guy's garbage ever again or this woman's teachings ever again. I will never listen to that stuff again. That stuff, as far as what I know from the Bible now, that stuff is dead to me. It has no life in it. It is not my future. It is now part of my past, and I'm not about to go backwards, back into it. I'm, I've already come out of Egypt. I'm headed to the promised land. Somebody, I need to have somebody say amen. So now look at what he says in verse 6. This is where it's going to hit home. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee, notice here, secretly. Because let me tell you, let me tell you something. Embedded in the Hebrew roots doctrine is a secret that at the first they don't want you to know about. That's what's embedded in there. That's the reason why they, they try to teach you that there's four levels of understanding the Torah. The Peshat level, which is just the literal, you just, just read and believe it, Moses ascended up to Mount Sinai. And then there's the hinted meaning. Moses ascended up to Mount Sinai. Wink, wink, wink. In other words, it's not actually said, but you're going, ooh, maybe there's a deeper understanding of that. Moses, yeah, Moses, you get it? Moses ascended up, yeah, to Mount Sinai, ooh, yeah. And where is it written? It's not. And then you get the, the sowed level, the fourth level, which is this mysterious or secretive or mystic level. And what, then, what that level is, now you're hearing from spirits who are giving you doctrines that are not written in any of their books. And the Hebrew roots, that's what I was laying out this week. I've got an email from a guy. He does not like this week's Watchman broadcast. I can't help it. But that's what I was getting across this week. The root of the Hebrew roots movement is familiar spirits. L Isaac Luria, um, the guy who wrote the Zohar, uh, the Ari, the Arizal, the lion, these Hebrew rabbi mystics were being visited on a regular basis by spirits that were pretending to be, one pretending to be Elijah the prophet, one pretending to be Moses, one pretending to be the, the, the rabbi that wrote the Zohar, one pretending to be the guy who follows the guy who, who wrote the Zohar. And it's just an endless stream. These rabbis are being visited by spirits. And they're being given secret knowledge and secret doctrines. The, the white fire of the Torah, which means the blank unwritten on paper. They say that's the real secret. That it's hidden in there. And notice that. If thy brother, verse 6 again of, of Deuteronomy 13. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers. They'll do it secretly. And they have a secret that at the forefront, they cannot tell you about it. Because if they did, you'd be going, no way, I'm not falling for that. So they will entice you secretly. And so you might be asking the question, you might be asking the question, Pastor, how then, if 
they're going to do it secretly and they won't tell me what they're up to. How then can I know? You know what? I'm glad you asked that question because I figured you might be. Do what I did. Consult Scripture. Do what the Bereans did. Consult Scripture. Do what we are commanded to do. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Have it in your mind. Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealeth his secret to his servants, the prophets, and the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. If it's, if it's true and it's right, then it's in the book. And if it's a secret and they can't tell you, then you fill your mind with this book. And then finally, when they come out with it in some skewed way, you can go, you know what? That's wrong. And I know it. That contradicts the scripture. And there's no way in the world I'm going to fall for that. But see, here Moses and God is warning us that it's going to be members of our own family. And from the people that I've heard from so far, yep, that's where it's coming from, members of their own family. He said in verse 7, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, he's talking about the Canaanites, nigh unto thee or far off from thee, from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, neither hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him. But thou shalt surely kill him, thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. I want to tell you something, God was not, God had a zero tolerance. God, God, God did not have a coexist bumper sticker on his chariot. God was not voting for Hillary. God said, I have have like a zero tolerance for anybody who's going to try to draw my people away to a false God. And I'll tell you this. I am all about Mr. Accommodation. I'm Mr. Nice Guy. I love people. You come to our church. I'll treat you well. I'll give you things. I'll do anything in the world for you. But if I find out that you are going behind my back to try to get to my little flock here at Bethel with false doctrines and false teachings and false ways, I will turn on you. I will turn on you like a cop turning around to give you a ticket. I'll be mean about it, too. I'll not be nice about it. I don't have an open pulpit policy where just any... Who do you recommend? Let's bring in in Paula White next Sunday. Yeah, Paula White would be awesome. And I don't agree with her some things, but you want it. So, yeah, we'll do that. That's not my pulpit. I don't do that. And I had a family. And I won't get into all the details, but they rolled into town and their objective was to go behind my back to, in their mind, straighten out this church. And when it all came to light one night and I caught him in a bold faced lie, I mean, he lied looking into my eyes through his teeth. He lied and I caught him in it. I put him out, put him and his whole family out that night. So they go to Pastor Waymar's church here across town, Second Baptist, Independent Fundamental. Pastor Waymar and I are good friends. And four or five months later, Pastor Waymar is calling me saying, Mike, do you know such and such? I said, yeah. He said, what can you tell me about him? And I told him, and he said, I'm going to have to put him out. They were doing the same thing there. God has a zero, zero tolerance policy. When it comes to, when it comes to people in my church, we don't always agree on everything. I'm sure some people don't always agree with everything that comes out of my mouth. That's one thing because we are going to have disagreements. But when it comes to people coming in here just to pull away disciples unto themselves, you better believe I'm going to be proactive all over you. Anyway, 
verse uh, 10, And thou shalt stone him with stones, that he die, because he has sought to thrust away, uh, thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And all Israel shall hear and fear and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. Now, uh, let me follow that up. I don't have it in my notes. Let me follow it up with Deuteronomy 18. Turn there. Turn right to it. Look at there. Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18 is where the uh, forbidden practices are. In verse 10, you're not to have your daughters pass through the fire. No divination, no observer of times. Jim, St- I still remember this like it was, I wrote it down and it never left my mind. Jim Staley. St- St- but by the way, I found out that Jim Staley's blog has now been taken down. He no longer has access to getting stuff out on the internet anymore. I think God shut it down. Uh, but anyway, Jim Staley standing there admitting, it's, it's on his YouTube videos, go, go watch it. He says, I believe when we observe times on Yahweh's calendar, there's like a special connection that we get to Yahweh. And I'm just going, you just said it. You just said we observe times. Okay? An observer of times, an enchanter, a witch. Anyway, all of those religious practices will lead people astray. And and he says, don't listen to these false prophets, because he's going to send them, verse 15, a prophet. Notice that's capital P. Verse 18, I will raise them up a prophet, capital P. Guess who that is? That's Jesus with a capital J. Amen? So now watch this. Um, verse 19. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. He said, my words, my words. If you don't listen to what your Bible says, God's going to require it out of you. All the stuff that you decided wasn't for you or all the stuff that you decided had been translated right or all the stuff that you decided that was for them 2,000 years ago but has no application for us today, God's going to take every bit of that stuff and nail you with it. So it says in verse 20, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? God makes it so easy, so easy to discern whether or not this guy comes along, he says he prophet, He said these things, look like they come to pass. Should we listen to this guy? God makes it so easy. Here's what he said. Verse 22. Verse 21. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Verse 22. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. So it's very simple. If he said God said it, and it never happens, he's not a prophet of God. You see, the prophet of God, whether it be Elijah, Hosea, Jean-Baptiste, St. Paul, Moses, Enoch, David, any of the prophets, they had to be 100% correct in everything they said. If they said one thing, just one, and I've had, I've, I've seen people brag about, oh, Pastor, this guy, this, this brother so and so, he's an apostle and he's a prophet, and he has like, like, eighty percent of what he says comes to pass. <gasps> Do you think he's a prophet of God? No. Well, why not? He was wrong once, wasn't he? Well, yeah. But most of what he said came to pass. Yeah. I believe the devil will raise up people, give them things to say, and most of it comes to pass. And the ignorance of man will follow people like that. But God says, if he's, and I'm going to tell you something. The, the fake prophets, God will not allow them to be right every time. He will not allow it. 
They'll prophesy something. They may have prophesied nine things accurately. The tenth thing, God is going to be sure that it never happens, and it doesn't. And now you can say, he was wrong once. He cannot be my prophet. I will not listen to him. See this right here? This is the written record of the word of God. This is every word in this book is pure. Every word in this book is holy. Every word in this book is 100% as accurate as the record of it is in heaven. Thy, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. This book right here is 100% true in every word on the pages. How do I know? Because God is the one who set the standard. The standard is, if it's wrong one time, you do not have to be afraid of it. Now, you think about what the devil's trying to do. What the devil did in the Garden of Eden. He tried to get what God said to be wrong. You shall not surely die, for God doth know. He trying to get what God said to be wrong. And God is never wrong. Neither is this book. This book has one error in it. If this book says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. If that book, if this book, it turns out that 1 John 5, 7 should have never been in the Bible, and it was never in any of the original manuscripts. If it turns out that 1 John 5, 7 should never have been in this Bible, then it's wrong, and I'll throw it away. So here you tell me, oh, I think the King James is a good translation, but it's not perfect. When you tell me that, according to the rules of, of Deuteronomy 18, if you tell me that my Bible is not right in some places, what I should do is burn it and get rid of it. And then when you start telling me that all the translations have errors in it, what I'm commanded to do as, a, as what God said in Deuteronomy 18 is to burn every Bible that I can get my hands on and tell people, you don't read that, it's got mistakes in it. That's what I should do. So either this book is right 100% or you throw it away. It's not, a, it's not a matter of degrees of how right it is in most things that it says. It's not a matter of that. That was never in the picture anywhere. If something is qualified as being pure, even in the scientific world, even in measuring things, if something from a factory is supposed to be four centimeters exactly, and it comes out four meters and one millimeter longer than it should be, it doesn't work. You ought to, you ought to come to St. Louis and see the St. Louis Arch. You ought to see this thing. It is absolutely amazing how they built this thing. They didn't just order the whole thing from the arch factory and it come out um, already put together and they just had to stand it up some way. No, 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 no. They started at two ends and they had to have, see the arch is, is like shaped, each piece is shaped sort of diamond shaped and the interior of it is to a point. And when the, when the two bottom pieces of that arch of the arch was laid down some 630 feet apart from one another. Whoever laid those two pieces down had to lay them exactly lined up perfectly. Because if there was any variance whatsoever, by the time they get to the top, the, the pieces won't match. And the whole thing would come tumbling down. They'd have to, they'd have to tear it down, start all over again. We wouldn't tolerate that in our house building, would we? 
If you build a house, it's got to be right. If you get into a car, you buy a new car, it's got to be right. If you take medicine, that medicine has to be totally perfectly right. You, you can only take such and such milligrams at so many certain times a day. If the doctor says to the nurse, give him 30 cc's of ibuprofen or whatever it is, she is to give him 30 cc's of ibuprofen. Nothing more, nothing less. We don't accept that kind of tolerance anywhere else that has an effect on our lives. We wouldn't accept it. Why are we accepting it in the Bible? If God said the Bible, the prophet, had to be right 100% of time, and you start then measuring by degrees how right somebody is, this is, this, is, this is why you will hear me. I do not have a problem in the world telling you. Ninety, Let's say 90% of what I say is dead on. I know for a fact there are things that I say that are not right. If I knew they weren't right, I wouldn't say them. So I don't know where I'm wrong. Because if I knew where I was wrong, I would correct it. Then I would be right. But I'm telling you, not even I can think of myself that everything that I think or say is right 100% of the time. Only God's word is that way. And if you've been if you've had it drilled into you that God's word is wrong in only a few places, then according to God's rule, it's to be discarded. It cannot be used. And any any factory, any factory that manufactures precision items or whatever it is, they have a quality control. They have some sort of control specialist that works at that factory that does nothing but make sure that everything that comes off that assembly line is 100% accurate according to the specifications. And if it's not, it's to be rejected. If it's wrong one time, people, if, that, if my Bible is wrong one time, it's to be discarded. In its place, think of it this way. When people tell you that the Bible is right in most everything that it says, there's mind, and in, what, and in their statement, there's going to be a gap. A gap, a hole, that needs to be filled with something that makes up the gap. Your Bible is 80% true. So I'm going to give you the other 20% to make it whole and make it complete. That's where the secret doctrines start coming in. The devil didn't just say that everything that God said was a lie. He just said one little part of it was. Now I'm going to fill in the gap for you. This is where the secret doctrines come in. Um, look at Deuteronomy 27. Deuteronomy 27. I'm keeping my eye on some uh, emails coming in here. Yeah. Lisa, yeah. From members of thine own family. Yep, amen. I'm not going to read the rest of it, but yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, Catherine says, PM, with regard to the enticement of secrets, have you noticed how all the rabbi websites use the word hidden? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, where is it? Right here. Somebody sent me this. Um, buried treasure. Secrets for living from the Lord's language. This is from Rabbi Daniel Lapin. And this is the first time that I'm opening it up. A couple days ago. And I almost guarantee you that this book has, yeah, look at here, Source of Spiritual Energy. Yeah. Um, I almost guarantee you that this thing is full of, there are secrets in the Hebrew letters that, that is not written in your Bible. And, and if you have these secrets, then you can, have, you can have these energies, and you can have this, and you can have that. I almost guarantee you that that's what's in here. Haven't looked at it yet, so I may be wrong. 
But when it's set, let me read the back here. Decipher the hidden mysteries in God's ancient alphabet. And unearth the deeper meanings within. Do you know what that means? That means the hidden meanings are in a pit. Unearth the deeper meanings within. That means they're buried. That means they're dead and somebody threw dirt over it. And they want you to dig it back up. You may see ancient Hebrew script as two-dimensional ink on a page, but popular scholar, see, popular, he's part of the Christian and complex. Popular scholar Rabbi Daniel Lapin brings, quote, the Lord's language to life, showing you how, unlike English, each Hebrew word like a gold nugget, an exquisite jewel, or a fiber optic cable line, that was like the stupidest analogy I've ever heard in my life, contains rich 3D messages as well. Dig for these, says the rabbi, and you'll tap into a new depth of meaning for your life today. Garbage. Absolute garbage. What they're telling you is that the real secrets to, let's say, immortality, the real secrets to happy living, the real secrets that you're looking for are not in the Bible. You need the mystics. You need the language of the learned elders who have the secrets of the Hebrew language and the letters and what the letters really mean in order to find out the true secrets. What they're telling you is, let's go after other gods. And the gods are every one of those Hebrew letters that have a hidden secret meaning that's not in your Bible. Uh, what else here? Uh, it says off air, so I will do that. Yeah. Uh, Joe says, hey, Pastor Mike, I had a friend who came to visit me this past summer. He's a ginormous fan of Todd Bentley. When I mentioned to him that I strongly suspect that Todd is a false prophet, he flipped his lid. My friend was for a while Todd's right hand traveling the world with him and all that. I told him that there are zero scriptural references to back up the violence that Todd performs on people. Like, yeah, like doing roundhouse kick it kicks to people in their chest cavity because they have cancer. He then argued that everything Todd does is contained in one verse, John 21, 25. The verse which states, if all the works Jesus did were written down, then the whole world wouldn't be able to contain the book. See, they love that one. I told him that was silly because everything that we do has to be backed up by scriptures. He agrees, but uses that verse to back up things. Just wondering what your thoughts. It's He's like got a circular argument. Uh, 2125 talks, it's, it's at the end of the Gospel of John, which you remember what that guy said on Sid Roth? That he visited Heaven's Library and this quote-unquote Jesus told him, there was a secret book called John 22, and it was things that Jesus said and did that are not the Bible, and he wanted to bring it down, and Jesus said, oh, no, no, we, I can't let you take that book down there now. Tell you what, I'm going to bring you back one of these days, and I'm going to give you John chapter 22, and then you can take it down to every, you can be the angel that has another gospel in your hand. John 21, here's what it says. Um, let's look at, let's walk circumspectly, shall we? Verse 24, this is the disciple which testifies of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. There are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Now, there are some who want this verse to say, there are also many things, other things, which Jesus said. Because when this verse, more than likely, they don't quote it right. Or they will make it say what it does not say. What it does not say is there are many things that Jesus said that are not written here. That's what they want you to believe. The truth of it is, the Gospels are... A 24-hour, seven-day-a-week, play-by-play of every single event that happened in Jesus' life. I mean, my goodness. We see him at his birth. Then we see him 
at his, when he's 12 years old. What happened during those 11 years? We don't know. We see him at 12, and then next thing we know, 18 years later, we see him at 30 years. What happened in those 18 years? We don't know. And we know from ages 30 to 33 that he said some things, went to some places, did some things that are generalized in the Scripture, but not every single act, not every morsel of food that he ate, not every body that he talked to is written down in the Scriptures. But to use this verse, there are also many other things which Jesus did. To use this verse as saying that means then that what we do doesn't have to be in the Bible. That then creates a contradiction in the rest of the Scriptures. It contradicts, then, what was spoken twice of Jesus in thy book. In the uh, volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Jesus was going to follow the book. Jesus did follow the book. The apostles followed the word of God. All scriptures given by inspiration of God. And what these people want to do is they want to use this verse to introduce their own doings, which are not in the Bible, and contradicted in the Bible. Todd Bentley's teaching of another Jesus, and he's got another spirit, and he's preaching another gospel. And if that's the case, no amount of things that you th imagine Jesus would have done that's not written in the Bible, no amount of that stuff can ever correct the error. That's just all imaginary hooey is what it is. Um, oh, let's see here. Renee. Renee says, Mar marijuana extends the visual receptors of the eye so a person can see slightly into both the infrared and ultraviolet spectra, thus allowing you to physically see things that you would naturally never see. Or, to put it another way, to see things you shouldn't see. Renee, never knew that. I appreciate you uh, sending me that. All right? Yeah, David, pastor says... Pastor, uh, iPods, iPads, Facebook are altering our minds. David, I agree with that to the extent that people are learning about new doctrines from Facebook, from YouTube, from blogs, from podcasts. They're learning doctrines that had they just read the Bible, they would not even know those things. See, I guess that's why guys like this write books like this. Oh, what I'm going to tell you is not in the Bible. Well, it is in the Bible, but it's like secretly buried in there. You wouldn't know it unless I told it to you. That's a prophet right there who came up with something out of his own mind. And God said, you don't have to listen to him. Deuteronomy 27, 15. Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image, an abomination of the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsman, and putteth it in a... A secret place, and all the people shall answer and say, "Amen." Now, here's here's where we're going. When I when I'm studying, God said, "Mike, the secret. It's a secret. Study the word secret." So I just pulled it up on the on the software. This was even before the pure software. I had a copy of Quick Verse 3.0 that goes all the way back to the days of Windows 95. And it gives me these accurate counts. And the word searches are dead on. And I'd search the word secret or secrets or secretly. Anything related to secret. And I'm just starting at the beginning and I'm working through and I'm seeing, okay, something about the secret is taking an idol and putting it in a secret place. And I remembered Exodus 14 or excuse me, Ezekiel 14, where God told Ezekiel, see these guys, see the elders of Israel? They put idols in their heart. They worship idols, but they do it secretly. They don't want anybody, th they, they're going to look like they're the religious denominational leaders on the outside. Did you catch that? They're going to look like they are the, they're the religious um good old guy preacher boys 
that are making the preacher rounds at the good churches. In other words, their name is on the list of good preachers to come have at your church. And on the outside, you are being led to believe that these men walk with God. The truth of it is, they have an idol in their heart. You can't see it, but it's there. And God told Ezekiel, it's there, Ezekiel. I can see it. And I'm telling you to reveal to everyone. They have idols, all right. They put them in their secret place, in their heart. See, I'm catching this, and, I'm, and I know then, I know then that in the book of Revelation, the false prophet is going to lead everybody to make an image of the beast, an idol. I know Thessalonians 2 says, the man of sin who opposeth all that is called God or that is worshipped, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And I know then that part of the secret that is in masonry, the secret of that secret society, the society was secret, their secret has something to do with the image of the beast in the temple of God. Putteth an idol in a secret place. Um, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord, our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. And what you're seeing here is, yes, there are secrets, but God reveals those secrets to his people. God wants us to know, and he says here that we may do all the words of this law. In other words, God did not write. Here's, here's what the, uh, the Jewish mystics and the Hebrew roots people want you to believe. They want you to believe that when Moses came down from Sinai, that he had two Torahs. One was the written Torah. One was the unwritten Torah that he couldn't tell everybody what it was. It was a secret. It had to be kept from just plain old redneck hillbilly Jews they couldn't know what that secret was. Only the leaders, only the exalted rabbis that could be trusted with a secret doctrine, they are the ones who could know it. And right here, right here, it says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. How can you know whether or not you're keeping the law of God or not when you have someone telling you not everything that God does or demands of us is in the Bible. What you're telling us then is that God has a law out there somewhere that he will not tell us, he will not show us what it is, but we are required to to be subservient to that law and obedient to that law. How in the world can we be if we don't know what the law is? It's like um, it's like the health care law that was passed by the United States Congress who were not even given a chance to see what was in the law. They were given the law they were said, we're going to vote on this at noon tomorrow. And by the way, if you think you have a copy of it, you don't because we made changes to it. And we're going to change it up and until the time that everybody votes on it. And that's what happened. Congress voted in. And I would say that a lot of these people who would have voted no on it were either, number one, bribed. Or they were promised large sums of um of conciliation money, in other words, money from the federal government going to their constituencies to make them look good, or outright blackmailed and said, you know that NSA thing that we do? We've got pretty much everything you've ever said on a cell phone to all the women you said it to. We have cameras that watched you go to such and such person's hotel room. We have the uh, bank records 
of where you're keeping the money that not even your wife knows about. You don't think that goes on? You don't think that goes on in the United States of America? You don't think that U.S. congressman putting his hand on a Bible, swearing to defend the Constitution, you don't think that guy's got dirty secrets? You don't think that guy can be gotten to? All they got to do is go to about 90% of these congressmen and congresswomen and say, look, we've got emails, we've got pictures, we've got phone logs, we've got text messages, we've got your Snapchat photos that you took. By the way, you need to lose some weight. We've got all of that. And all we ask you to do is vote yes. Now, we're not mean. We'll we'll give we'll give you an out. We'll give you large sums of money for your for your district. You can put it you can put people to work. You can opt out of certain government regulations. Just just tell us what you want to you. But if you even think about voting no, then all of a sudden some hacker is going to get into our database and find out stuff about you that you don't want known. People, I don't have to be the full wall to know that that stuff happens. You remember the Mayflower, what's the Mayflower Madam? Or the DC Madam? DC Madam. You remember her? She was the lady that ran an upper class prostitution service in Washington, D.C. And I don't know what she did, but she made somebody mad. And they went after her. And she made it known, I have a database of names and phone numbers. I have them in a secret location. And if anything happens to me, that database is supposed to go all over the internet. And it has names of people who do not want their names on that list. If And she won Alex Jones. And Alex Jones asked, and I don't like Alex Jones, but he asked her point blank a week before she was found dead. Do you feel like committing suicide? She said, absolutely not. She said, I'm in this for the fight. And I'm just telling these people right now, they better back off. Or I'm going to open the nasty lid on everything that I know about some very powerful people. And he said, so if they find you dead somewhere and call it a suicide, it's not a suicide. And she said, absolutely not. And they found her dead about a week later, hanging. One sleeve rolled up, one sleeve rolled down. There's a picture on the internet. You can find it of a man entering the third degree of the lodge. They put a noose around his neck. They blindfold him. One sleeve is rolled up and one sleeve is down. One pant leg is up. One pant leg is down. Shirt partially unbuttoned, partially buttoned. You know what that is? That's opposites. Okay? And that's how she was found. And I'm telling you, there are secrets out there they don't want people to know. Secret societies have a secret they don't want people to know. It's in your Bible. Everything you need to know is in your Bible. And the people who would tell you that it's not are the people who don't get their stuff from the Bible. Or they would never tell you that. All right? Well, I've had fun today. I had no idea what I was going to talk about today. I, I just I just enjoyed it. I may, may do this again Thursday. Well, I'm not done. We're not done looking at the secret. We'll look at some more Thursday. All right? Man, I love you guys. You're the reason why I do this stuff, all right? So I will see you. Pure Bible Study, Watchmen broadcast tomorrow, tomorrow, Wednesday night. God bless you. I love you.